from Music City, USA, it's David Hooper and Music Business Radio. From the TuneIn Broadcasting Studios in Nashville, Tennessee, this is Music Business Radio, your weekly backstage pass to the biz. My name is David Hooper, and with me today, Paul Worley. Paul's career covers over 30 years as a musician, publishing executive, and record company executive. Right now, he's running Skyline Music. He's worked with acts like Martina McBride, Dixie Chicks, Sarah Evans, Colin Ray, Big and Rich, and Lady Antebellum. Paul, welcome to Music Business Radio. Thank you, David. Glad to be here. Let's talk about how you got started in the business. You're actually a musician at first. Music was my hobby in high school and in college, and I graduated from Vanderbilt only to realize that the only thing I really cared about was playing the guitar, so I thought, well, hell, I'm 21, you know, maybe I can make a living playing this guitar and not have to actually uh, go somewhere and work for a living. <laughs> And it turned out, you know, Vanderbilt is right down the street from Music Row. Yeah, who knew? Yeah, you're right in the same neighborhood. Didn't even have to move. That's right. But I didn't know. It might as well have been 10,000 miles away. How did you break in, though? There are a lot of great guitar players here in Nashville. They've actually, you know, written a song about that. Yeah. And uh, not just anybody can go there and start playing on records, but is that how it happened for you? No. These days, I say Nashville's an eight-year town. It certainly was for me. But at my first job with my college degree in, in hand, I, I got a job for 50 bucks a week sweeping floors six days a week at a studio but i was in the music business that was the important thing and you didn't study music in college blair was just coming online the blair school but vanderbilt didn't have a music program peabody which was associated with vanderbilt had a, a music program but it was primarily for teachers and so mtsu didn't have their program belmont hadn't even thought about it so i just learned in the clubs and on the street so that's how you did it yeah well, what was that first job like? Well, I was a gopher. And what a gopher means is, hey, you, uh, go for this or go for that. That's what they used to call us back in the day. When they were building the studio, I would stuff the walls with fiberglass, wire the room, answer the phone that was in the middle of the concrete floor, and they'd say, Paul, can you come up the street to the old studio and uh, can you sing? Well, yeah, I can sing. Oh, come up here. We need somebody to sing a jingle. Oh, okay. So I'd run up the alley to where Country Life restaurant was. I don't know if you remember that. And and I'd sing a little jingle, and then I'd run back down the street and get my hammer and nails, and <laughs> that was life for that year. So was know? that kind of your first taste of being on records was jingle singing? Jingles and sound-alikes and demos. I never really knew what was what. I just knew that I was showing up. And I either had a hammer in my hand or a guitar. And then the guitar was probably better than the hammer, Guitar right? was better than the hammer. I never could hammer a nail, but you've got to do what you <laughs> do. Gotta what you got to do. Well, hey, talk about the sound of lights, because you mentioned that before we walked into the studio. And I think this is just a great, amazing thing that you did that probably really helped you with getting the sound that you have on these artists that you've worked with. Yeah. I worked for a company called Audio Media Recorders. Their main accounts were companies like KTEL or Plantation. And KTEL is like the old TV uh, yeah, advertising, TV. like original artists that made them great, but they weren't the original artists that you were dealing with. You were dealing with people who sounded like the original artists. Well, no, it's not both, actually. If, uh, if I was doing for Plantation, we were doing current hits of all genres. So one week we'd do a, an R&B soul record that would copy all of the current hits with local singers. But my local singers were people like Freddie Waters and Jimmy Church and, I mean, you know, people that were local R&B legends. The next week we'd do a rock record and then the third week of the month we would do a country record. But those were sound alikes. The k were re-recordings and we would actually work with artists, you know, everybody from Paul Revere and the Raiders to Little Richard to Kenny Rogers to... Timmy Euro to anybody that ever had a career, we would come and we would re-record their records. So we were actually working with the actual artists on those. Explain to everybody, because we have some people here that aren't really familiar with the logistics and the finances of the business. Well, why do you re-record rather than go and get those original recordings? Well, KTL knew that they could cheaply re-record the records. We could cheaply re-record the records, and then they could own the masters. So they could sell them and package them again and again and again and again and again without having to go and license those, the original recordings from the uh, major labels who owned those. And it was very commonly done. I mean, I remember when Conway Twitty moved from Warners to MCA, the first thing that Jimmy Bowen had him do was go back and re-record all of his mm -hmm. Warner Brothers catalog so that MCA could not only go forward with the new albums, but could repackage and sell 
is uh, classic material. You know, we still see that a lot today, actually. It's still a really common practice. I was on Amazon just the other day. I wanted to get a song by Jefferson Starship, downloaded it. Well, it same, sounds huh? a little off. Yeah, it's a yeah. different band. Original singer, but a different band. Look, it's cheesy as hell. It's what we did to make a living. But, yeah, you know, you really want the original thing, don't you? I mean, that's what I always wanted. Well, absolutely. Especially nowadays, it's like 99 cents to download a single. And yeah. you can get the original for the same price. So. Right, right, right. So you really want the original moment in time. You want that thing. And you don't want the singer 30 years later. But it was a great education. Re-recording those hits was a great education. It allowed me to understand, you know, what about this was a hit. Well, and you had a certain sound, and you had to replicate that sound. Yeah. This is Music Business Radio. My guest today, Paul Worley, has been in the music business over 30 years, working for artists like Martina McBride, Dixie Chicks, Sarah Evans, Colin Ray, Big and Rich, and Lady Antebellum. What is it that has allowed you to last in the business for 30 years? What do you credit with that? I never stop trying to reinvent myself, or I never feel like I've arrived as a musician or as a creative person. You just have to evolve. It's like living is evolving. I don't see how anybody lives in any kind of life without evolving. So I think that's what's kept me going. Do you have any like, longevity stories with the people that you've met over the years? Because some of those guys that you, you were recording you know, back in the 70s and the 80s, they're still around. Well, you know, they are. They're still around, and they're on the, the waning years of their careers, but they still have careers out there in the, in the real world playing live music, and some of them are making indie albums. But, you know, my, my first number one hit was with a guy named Eddie Raven working for a young record executive named Joe Galani back in the day. And I remember I got a bunch of grief. I made that album. That album had like four or five number one hits on it, and I spent $69,000 making it and that was nine thousand dollars over budget yeah <laughs> so i was it, joe wasn't happy about that but it worked out yeah i'm sure he forgave you once those royalty checks well, started coming in we've made a lot of music together over the years was that really like your first boss your first really big boss that and uh and gary morris who was an artist on warner brothers were my first opportunities to try and make hit records for major labels I made the first Riders in the Sky album for National Geographic Society. Mm -hmm. I remember when Woody Paul looked at me, we were making the Three on the Trail album, and Woody Paul looked at me and said, Paul, do you think these are country hits? And I looked at him and I think I said something like, well, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> You're asking me, you know. <laughs> yeah, because you weren't a country fan growing up. I mean, it, you're yeah. really kind of known for your work in the country music genre, but that wasn't what you were listening to. No, I, I didn't like country music. Wrongly, I thought it was hokey, and I didn't understand it, and I, I had never given it a chance to get inside of me. But once I went to work on Music Row, I started to understand it. Talk a little bit more about that transition from sound likes and re-records to working with acts like Riders in the Sky, Eddie Raven, the more established acts. You know, the most important thing for anybody that wants to be in the business is to show up. And when they ask you if you can do something, if you can do it, say yes. And don't... I never put any conditions on what I was willing or not willing to do. If somebody wanted me to work, I was ready to work. So as I worked my way up the ladder in this studio company, I became an in-house musician. My partners in that in-house band were Eddie Bayers, Dennis Burnsides, and, and Sonny Garish, and some really great musicians. So over time, we just sort of naturally became a team. And we clicked, you know, we knew how to communicate without even talking about it. And along the way, a lot of my buddies who were young songwriters and artists would go and, and I would watch them go in the studio and just kind of flounder around and not know how to communicate what they and, and not know how to get what they wanted and waste a lot of time. So it, it occurred to me that I could sort of communicate for them. So I would go to them and go, hey, look, let's get together. I'll do your charts. We'll discuss what we're trying to do. I'll make sure the musicians understand that, and we'll try and get those sounds. And by golly, we'll probably get five songs in one session instead of two. Mm -hmm. And uh, that turned into producing. Yeah, but, I mean, because you were working the board and you were recording the music as a musician. So that's a, a perfect job for that. Bring, yeah. the, bring the two together. Bring right. people together. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Communication. How did Gary Morris say, hey, I want you to produce me? 
Well, it was it was part of that process that I just described was that I had become sort of well known amongst the songwriters as, as somebody they could go to and get their demo sessions organized, and and we were coming out with some really good sounds. So me and my team became kind of a go to. Part of my team at that time was also Marshall Morgan, the great engineer, and a guy I had known in, in college. And so Gary came in to work with me and Marshall because he liked the sounds that we were making. We cut some demos, and he got a record deal. And so he then went to uh, Warner's and said, Hey, I, I really want my guys to produce me. I'm comfortable with them. If you like what we've done, why don't you give them a chance? Then that's how it happened. You're listening to Music Business Radio. I'm your host, David Hooper. With me today, Paul Worley. He's got a list of credits that are who's who of artists from folk, blues, rock, pop, country, big band, and rhythm and blues. People like Sarah Evans, Colin Ray, Big and Rich, and also Lady Antebellum. More from Paul when we come back on Music Business Radio. You're listening to Music Business Radio. Tune in to the Indie Underground Hour every Monday night from 9 to 10 here on Lightning 100. I'm Doyle from Grimey's, your weekly guide as we explore fresh sounds emerging from the underground, like Melody's Echo Chamber, Tame Impala, Django Django, Little Bandit, and Luella and the Sun. The Indie Underground Hour, Monday nights at 9 on Lightning 100. Hi, this is Tim McFadden. You know, I've worked for RCA Records and Sony, and I started Giant Records and BNA and all of these record labels, but I have to say that everything I've ever learned, I've learned from listening to Music Business Radio. Music Business Radio is on the air. I'm David Hooper, your host, and with me today, Paul Worley. And you've got something new that's very exciting, Paul. It's Skyline Music, and it's a, a new venture for you. Yeah, Skyline is where I've decided to go and try and be part of the future of the music business, which I think everybody knows has is changing radically. A lot of people say it's dying. A good friend of mine compares this time to back in the day, in the, the beginnings of the music business, what people would do in Tin Pan Alley was they would go around and they would hear somebody play a song, and they'd go up and they'd go, you know, I like that song. I want to buy that song. And they would buy the song, and then they would publish the song, which meant that they would actually print the song and sell the sheet music. So, th so they would actually buy the rights to it? Yeah, yeah, and they'd buy the song and sell the sheet music. Then, soon after the turn of the century, this guy Edison came up with a cylinder-shaped thing, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, the guys that were in the music business of that day said, Oh, my God, what are we going to do? People can now listen to recordings of these songs. They don't have to buy the sheet music. They can actually hear somebody record the song. This is a Wally Wilson story. <laughs> I'm stealing from Wally Wilson, but it's true. So they said, well, we can't, uh, you know, what are we going to do? The business is over. Well, the music business wasn't over. The music business was going to change and become mm -hmm. bigger than it ever, ever, ever would have been if it had been just a print business. Right, right. So we're doing it right now. This cell phone in my hand is the new wax cylinder. Right. You right. Know? So you're not one of these guys that's going to blame the download for all the problems that Music Row is having. You know, you can blame if you want to, but life moves on. I mean, the Internet's a wonderful thing. Would anybody argue that the inter is, is the Internet a bad thing? No, it's a great thing. It's changing the world. And we're just at the beginning of what's probably going to be a hundred-year sweep of change that's going to happen because of this thing called the Internet. So, you know, who's to judge whether it's bad or good? It just is, and mm -hmm. we have to adapt to it. Well, there's certainly a lot of opportunities for musicians to make money now that there weren't, you know, 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, video game licensing, a lot of uh, direct-to-video films, you know, mm -hmm. they need music supervision and, and music going behind those films. So, th yeah, there's certainly a lot of opportunities. Uh, it's well, cheaper to release a record now. For one, you don't have to put it on plastic disc and right. send it out everywhere. Right. And, you know, I've got this cell phone. It's not that new, really, but new to me but i can hold it up to a speaker in a restaurant and it's hearing a song it'll identify the song it'll show me a picture of the artist and the title of the song and it'll give me a choice i can hit a button and if i want it i can download i can own that song right now okay wait a minute let me make sure i got this right so if i were to play a song on like a, a boom box or something yeah your 
phone, we put that in front of the speaker, right? And it, it can figure out what that song is. Oh yeah, it'll it'll show me the picture of the artist. It'll tell me the name of the song, and it'll go, "Do you want the ringtone or do you want the whole song?" And I click a button, boom, on the chip on this phone right here. I have now stored the whatever song I bought. Now they're charging a dollar ninety nine. So it bills you automatically. Bills me automatically on my Verizon. This mine's a Verizon, but they have them. Uh, all the other services have them. And for a buck ninety nine, I've got the song. Now their price is out of line. Well, but that'll may adjust. Maybe, but you know what I love about that is they're making it easier for you to purchase than mm -hmm. they are to steal it. And everybody's worried about this theft. And I've always said, wait a minute. Listen, if you make it easier for people to spend money than steal, they'll do it. You, they will do it because people are lazy. That's why we got a bunch of drive throughs in this country. Right, right. So th this is kind of like the equivalent of that, isn't it? It's like yeah, the mu yeah. musical drive through and, 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 and music is an impulse thing. So you hear something you like, you can buy it, and then, you know, you've got Bluetooth in your phone, and you've got Bluetooth on your computer and Bluetooth in your car, so you can shoot it from your phone to any of your other devices where you store your music, and there you are. Well, and you know what else is really exciting? Like, recently, you know, the Internet has become what we call wireless. It was mm -hmm. attached to a phone line or a cable for a long time, and, and music is what people do when they're out like they're out eating dinner and they're out they, they like it in the background so you can take it with you now yeah we're at the beginning of that so what we have to understand is that when you talk about opportunities to sell and resell great songs and music we're just at the very very beginning of something so i think it's exciting it's just that can we survive long enough to get through the gap between now and when when there's a real saturation in the marketplace you're listening to Music Business Radio. I'm David Hooper, your host. And with me today, Paul Worley. His career covers 30 years as a musician, publishing executive, record company executive. And now he's the head of Skyline Music, chief creative officer, would you say? Uh, I, I really always just wanted to be uh, head of Lettuce Records. <laughs> <laughs> but you invented the title chief creative officer when, CCO. You, were, when you were at uh, Warner Brothers. Yeah. They were saying, oh, we're a new company. It's a free range company. Nobody has a title. And I'm looking at the guy I'm working for, I'm going, well, you got a title. <laughs> <laughs> Boss. <laughs> yeah. And it's just, look, you know, everybody in it's Nashville, I mean, everybody needs to know who to go see for what. So if you don't want to call me, you know, head of A&R, then we'll come up with something. So we came up with that. You know, chief creative officer, it's funny, one of our sponsors, Avenue Bank, they have a chief creative officer, and she actually took it from the record business. So you started a trend here. I admit, I am the guy that came up with that. I'm but what do, you, what do you do? What does chief creative officer do? I was head of A&R, chief creative officer. I'm in charge of all things creative in a creative business. So my job was to identify artists, to identify producers, to nurture them, to as much as possible allow them to express themselves but yet, and still guide them to where they want to get, which in my case mostly was on country radio, and to just kind of herd all of that activity and make it come together. During the first section of the show, we talked about your team. You kind of put a team together, and that was one of the ways that you actually became a producer, made the jump to producing. And did you have a team together when you put together Skyline, like a, a group of people that you wanted to work with? Yeah, we have a team approach to what we're doing, and, and I'm very excited about it because I think we really have the best people, and we have a, a complete package. We're in the artist development business. To me, that's the future. And to me, artist development doesn't actually happen very well at record labels anymore. They can't really give it the time or detailed attention or They're just really too big? It's too time intensive and it's too expensive for them to do. They need to be able to look at the results of artist development and pick the ones that fit them and then go to the marketplace. And it just more properly belongs outside of a major label. That's what I believe. Not everybody would agree. But we're an artist development company, meaning we have production, we have publishing, we have management, and we have marketing. And we have it all in-house, and we have a great vision for the business of the future. And the, the business of the future is if you're an artist, you need to be in business every day of your life. This whole notion of I'm going to go in this development phase and then I'm going to come out the other end and then I'm going to get in business is gone. Mm -hmm. Every day is a day to try and take yourself to the marketplace. Every day. That's what we preach in our place. What are the pros and cons of being with a smaller company? Because you've worked with Sony Music Nashville, Sony Publishing, Tree, Warner Brothers. What are some pros and cons of a big company like that and pros and cons of doing what you're doing now? Well, the pros of being with a small company is that you can decide what you want to do and then you can do it. 
And how quickly does that happen? Like over lunch or? It can. I mean, it can happen certainly over a small period of time. I mean, a day, a week. Well, let's say like you want to move an, an album release back. I mean, oh. that would be like that would be like real, or move the studio date back. That would be really really quick compared to like Sony. Did you have to drive everything up a committee or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you're working for a corporation, you've got a lot of people that you have to convince to get on your bandwagon, and that takes time, and it slows you down. You know, and then the worst part about it is you've got a lot of people second-guessing your job, then ultimately that can bring you down to failure. So, because the creative business is one of recognizing things that don't exist and bringing them to the marketplace. Well, it's the scariest thing for you to ask your sales force to do. You know, they're going, but nobody's ever done this. And you go, mm -hmm. that's exactly why we need to be doing it. You yeah, know? you really got to believe in it and trust. And it's like you said, it's not just you. You got to convince everybody else. Yeah. But now the upside of being with a large company is that you have a lot of resources, especially back in the day, you had a lot of resources. So you could, you know, it would allow someone like me to work with a lot of different artists and sort of oversee some projects and produce some myself. And it was really a lot of fun to have that large a palette to work with. I have to be much more choosy with my small company because we only have so many people and it's not really a money thing although sometimes it is but it's really mostly a an energy thing yeah there's only so much to go around in there yeah but we've got great people i'm partnered up with wally wilson who's been my he, well he's been on the show yeah i know and again that wax cylinder thing that i referred to that story is a wally wilson story so I gotta, gotta give, give him his props. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody who wants to hear that show, by the way, musicbusinessradio.com, just search for Wally Wilson. It's it's an amazing show. You get you guys have got a good team, I can tell. Yeah, we've been friends for a long time and we, we share the same vision. You know, we have a very high degree of trust. And we're lucky to have on board Bob Titley, who after retiring for a small period of time we were able to convince him to come on board with us going forward. I've tried to get him on too. You gotta send him our way too. He's awesome and he's great, very articulate and uh he managed Brooks and Dunn for, you know, 20 years. And so we legitimately say we're in the management business. And then we have also Jenny Smythe working with our company. We've set her up in a, in a marketing company called Girl Little Marketing. She comes to us via companies like Yahoo back in the early days and then Warner New Media. And then most recently, Clear Channel Online. She developed all the Clear Channel Online platforms. She comes in, so she's a, a marketing person with a high degree of new media savvy. So that completes our package. Well, you talked about the limited energy that you have as one person, but you can replicate it by having a team, which is what you're doing. Any advice for people trying to put a team together? Well, you know what? You don't need to duplicate yourself. So when you're looking for team members, you need to look at people that have skills that you don't have, and then you need to get your ego out of the way of, of that. You know, you need to understand that they've got skills and points of view that are just as valid as yours, and you need to trust them. A good company can't just be about one person's point of view. Everybody's got to be empowered, and you know, even if they disagree, it's like, well, I, I may disagree with what you said, but I agree with you. Well, you know, they, that's what they say. If there's uh, more than one person in the room and they all agree, you really don't have a need for all of them. Yeah, yeah. You, so, And I guess putting a band together would be the same thing, wouldn't you say? Yeah, it's good to, you know, shoot. Uh, I guess Big and Rich is probably the best exercise of that. I mean, they're, you know, fire and water uh, to, <laughs> together. And they made incredible music. I mean, the first yeah, Big and Rich album yeah. is really, 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 really good. As People probably f have forgotten that. But it really, really was innovative. And what they were about, and certainly the Music Mafia, which continues, is still a, very much about music for music's sake. But the downside of it is that eventually fire and water don't get along very well. <laughs> Extinguish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is Music Business Radio. I'm David Hooper, your host. With me today, Paul Worley. He's got a career that covers 30 years as a musician, publishing executive, and record company executives. Worked with acts like Martina McBride, Dixie Chicks, Marie Osmond, and Big and Rich. When we come back, I'm going to talk to Paul about the process of production. That's next on Music Business Radio. So what's your social calendar looking like on Tuesday nights? Don't lie, you're free. But you're probably sick of the same old two-for-Tuesday crowd or too many people cheating at trivia night. Yeah, we know. We got something for you. Beer, bands, and bingo. Starting at 7.30 every Tuesday night from Tin Roof, Nashville. 
My name is Wells Adams. Join me and grab a bingo card, a dauber, and a bucket of Henry Weinhardt's and enjoy the classic game with the new rock star twist. Every Tuesday, you can win CDs, T-shirts, drinks, concert tickets, and a killer grand prize. Bingo's free. The prizes you can win are awesome. So grab your friends, form a bingo team, and win some stuff. Beer, bands, and bingo. Powered by Henry Weinhardt's and Lightning 100. See you Tuesday at 7.30 on Tin Roof, Nashville. Bringing together music makers and movers and shakers. Music Business Radio. From the Tune In Broadcasting Studios in Nashville, Tennessee, this is Music Business Radio. I'm your host, David Hooper. And with me today, Paul Worley, a music producer working with acts like Dixie Chicks, Sarah Evans, Marie Osmond, and the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. Let's talk about how you get these acts. We've been talking about relationships and how important the relationships are. And that's how you found out about your new act called Family Farm. Yep. I call them Family Farm. They're the Henningsons, and it's a family from Illinois, a fifth-generation farm family living in the same house for five generations. They bought a house down here, and they come down. Mom and Dad have ten kids, and Dad and two of the kids started making music about a year and a half ago. And a friend of mine, Cactus Mosier, who was the drummer in, in Highway 101, called me up out of the blue. I hadn't seen him in a while. And he said, Paul, I got something you got to see. So he brought him in. They write great songs, and they're, they're songs that are great in a way that's uncrafted. They're just really great. They're, they're not that... Just like a raw energy, I guess. Oh, yeah. I mean, their form is all right. It's not that they don't conform to song form, but they're just not clever. They're, nobody's sitting in the room trying to be clever. They're just writing what they feel. Mostly the vocals are by the daughter and the son both of whom are great singers. The daughter is one of the best singers. Clara is one of the best singers I've ever heard. And she's 18 years old. So, as you can tell, I'm very excited about developing them. The songs are there, and the singing's there, but they've never really performed much. Mm -hmm. All that kind of stuff's got to happen. What is it that gets your attention? I mean, certainly the songwriting and the performance is there, but you mentioned there's something different about these guys. Are you looking for something different? I mean, if it's already been done before, do you kind of pass that up? Yeah, I'm not interested in copying anything. It's just boring. I mean, if I had to, I would, because I'd rather do that than work. <laughs> but as long as I can get away with... Yeah, you've already done that in your career anyway. Yeah. The uh, replications and the sound yeah. likes. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess maybe that's why. <laughs> never, thought about, never thought about that, but I kind of had my fill of that. But the thing about the Henningsons is that they are living proof of something that most of us believe doesn't exist anymore and that they are a working family farm they're what's great about this country personified yeah well and i think people can get behind that they've got the story which gets in the press and everybody can relate to that there's just it when you're looking at it you're, it's like looking at one of those paintings i can't remember the name of the artist but you know those americana paintings you know it's just it's beautiful. Oh, yeah, they like a Norman Rockwell. Norman Rockwell, yeah, and it's just beautiful and raw and real, and you just go, oh, my God, I thought that, you know, if you listen to the talking heads on the news, they'll tell you that that doesn't exist anymore. Right, right. And it doesn't exist in the malls. You're right, it doesn't exist in the malls, and a lot of the stuff that's in the malls, it's been produced and overproduced and then produced again. I mean, are you trying to, with your production style, bring that rawness out, like, in a different way? Yeah, these days I'm really more about trying to use less to do more and trying to make the music more real along that line uh, because I got a chance to work with Peter Collins who is just a, a brilliant producer I got a chance to be produced by him when I was an A&R guy we went in and we actually went to a rehearsal hall and rehearsed the music and then went in the studio and I went well what in the hell when did I forget about that yeah yeah you know so what I do these days is I'll get the musicians and the music and the songs and and we go to a place and we'll actually rehearse for several days and, and so that everybody is completely immersed in the songs and the music and what we're trying to mm -hmm. do and then we go to the studio and we cut and we come out with just great music I mean it feels good it's everybody's playing what they need to play everybody's not playing what they don't need to play which is huge and i really owe that to peter for reminding me about that but well that preparation is also great advice i would imagine if you're trying to save money you know don't want to be in the studio all the time everybody knows what they're going to play before they get in there you can mm -hmm. just get in and get out at least you break even i mean you got to pay the musicians to be there in the rehearsal so there's that cost but again you you go in you design what you're going to do off-site 
There's nothing more difficult than trying to communicate with a bunch of musicians via a talkback button on a console. It's just it's a horrible way to try and, and get ideas across. So sitting around in a circle on a stage with nothing but a back line is a great place to create yourself. You're listening to Music Business Radio. My guest today, Paul Worley, is a music producer working with acts like Big and Rich, Lady Antebellum, Marie Osmond, and the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. Had a great quote while we were walking in here, Paul. It said, don't cheap out. Well, don't cheap out on the music anyway. I mean, if music is what we are and if it's what we do, then that's clearly where the investment needs to be made. And maybe, you know, you could argue that part of the problem we have is that we have been cheaping out on the music and sort of treating it like product you know i hate that when people even talk about it you know record companies are famous for going, calling it product and you go what product what the hell is that it's like sausage so is that a shoe yeah you know <laughs> well you brought some product in for us today paul i brought you some mighty fine product <laughs> this is a family farm give us an intro on this song when they came in they played me this song eight minutes old and i can't get it out of my head and I've pitched it to every artist that I've been working with, haven't gotten anybody to record it, and it's finally made me conclude that I'm just going to have to make Family Farm a hit act and then record these songs. But this song is, is an amazing song. Unfortunately, you gotta, it's, it's a story song, so you have to listen to the whole thing. That works for me. Okay. So this is Family Farm on Music Business Radio, the song 8 Minutes Old. <laughs>
Family Farm on Music Business Radio. Wow, that was a story. Oh, it's an amazing story. And it, I get wows from people when I play it. I just haven't been able to get anybody to uh, to bite yet. Again, Clara, you know, nobody's going to sing it better than Clara anyway. So there's my answer. And that is how musicians get discovered here in Nashville. Paul, we got another way musicians get discovered. It's called Dave's Demo Derby. We've got that coming up next. It's where bands from all around the world send us demos, and then you and I review them. Oh, fun. You didn't tell me about yeah, that. Yeah, it's just like another day in the office for you. That is next when we come back on Music Business Radio. We'll be right back with more Music Business Radio. Music. Up next, Business. Dave's Demo Derby. Radio. Spring is in the air, and that means one thing if you love craft beer. It's time for Rhizome Productions' third annual East Nashville Beer Fest at East Park, March 23rd. Tickets go on sale February 21st at 9 a.m. at eastnashvillebeerfest.com. This event will sell out, so buy your tickets right away. Sample over 100 craft beers from over 40 different breweries. Enjoy food from Nashville's best food trucks and live music from Half Brass and Volunteer String Band. The third annual East Nashville Beer Fest, March 23rd at East Park. Brought to you by Rhizome Productions. For more information and tickets, like the East Nashville Beer Fest on Facebook, follow them on Twitter, or simply visit eastnashvillebeerfest.com. The third annual East Nashville Beer Fest is brought to you in part by Three Crowbar, All Seasons Garden and Brewing Supply Company, East Side Smiles, Whole Foods Market, Five Points Digital Imaging, and Lightning 100. Buy your tickets February 21st at eastnashvillebeerfest.com. Don't forget my Potter with my band, The Nocturnals, and you're listening to Music Business Radio. And now it's time for that part of the show we call Dave's Demo Derby. My name is David Hooper. My guest is record producer Paul Worley, and this is that part of the show where we open up packages sent in from around the world from Music Business Radio listeners who want professional opinion, Paul. You ready to give it to him? I'm scared. <laughs> I'm scared, too. I'm nervous. You, you hadn't heard the music yet, so okay. uh, you got something really scary here. All right. This guy, his name is uh, Liam Finn. He's from New Zealand. I'm kind of wondering if, if he's one of the Finn brothers. Well, if he is, he's already, then that puts him way up my list. Yeah, then I'm, we're in good shape. I'm a huge fan he's of it. He's got a song called Better Liam to Be, Finn. and this is Liam Finn on Music Business Radio. From New Zealand on Music Business Radio. What do you think, Paul? Well, the guy's talented. I mean, he's definitely got a good voice and, uh, and you know, good melodic sensibility. I mean, it sounds kind of strange. So, I don't know where he made that. It sounds like he had to make it in his closet somewhere. And, but he's a talented guy. The sheet he gave us says experimental. So, I guess he's, he's like a mad chemist in there. Just yeah. Well, you know, I, stuff I, up. I like the, the way he used his voice as a production instrument. And those little swarming uh, background vocals mm -hmm. and all that stuff's really cool. And he's got a pleasing voice, but, uh, you know, can't really tell much more from just that one song. Well, we got another guy here. He is from, it just says England. I don't know where in England he's from. His name is Baron Zero. He's got a song called No Easy Way. Thank you. 
inside you don't really want me to Don't ask me if I think it's a mistake Sometimes you give in unless you break Cause we're always the way And there's no always the way Why do you say I'm gonna leave you down? Beer and Zero out of England, the song No Easy Way. How about it, Paul? Well, I'm not in love with his voice. Am I allowed to say that? There's no easy way to say it. There's no easy way to say that. You're right. But you know, it's kind of dug the, you know, the, the growl of the bass and the punch yeah. of the track. And, you know, you could tell he was working with some cheesy keyboard samples and stuff. But he did a good job of that. But yeah, know. Sometimes cheese is good like that, though. Cheese you know? is good, but, you know, it's better when there's some meat with it, like a good singer, you know, or something like that. <laughs> What is it about a singer that gets your attention? Uh, I know you work with a couple more acts, uh, Chelsea, Chelsea Williams, and a group called The Shoals. You know, some acts have just amazing, they're like technicians. They've got these great classic voices, and others, maybe like Bob Dylan, for example, it's not, it's a different voice. What is it that gets your attention for singers? Well, it's, are they emoting? Is there emotion coming through? And my advanced years here I, I prefer to work with people that have great sounding voices you know it's just easier but even a great technical singer has to emote so again that's where you know a singer like Mick Jagger or Bob Dylan I mean I, it's great because they're, they're putting something across so it's not just about a melody and a lyric it's about extra thing that has to happen can that be taught or is that natural it can be taught I mean, for some people, it is natural, but it can be taught if people are willing. And it's one of the things I do is work with singers, young folks that are really good singers, and they, they get up to where they get a record deal. But I'm the guy that's always making them come back and sing again and again and again. And I'm not looking for technical perfection. I'm looking for emotion. And I guess at this point in your career, you're able to just zoom in on that raw talent and then develop it later. It doesn't have to be developed. I mean, you're in the artist development business. I've always been. That. That's what I've always been. I mean, the thing is, is I used to think I was an artist. So I guess I started out in the artist development business. Right. It didn't turn out too well for me. But I use the same process of how do you take this and help it realize its potential? We got another demo here for you. We're going to see if this guy has potential for emotion. It's Rex Moreau. He's from Louisiana. Is it Lafayette or Lafayette? Uh, well, down there it's Lafayette. No, no, down there it's Lafayette. Up here it's Lafayette. You see, you got the same problem I got. I got a lot of problems. Which one are you talking about? Well, you call you know Lafayette, Lafayette, and Santa Fe, and <laughs> all the crazy way we say things around here. <laughs> He's got a song called Cincinnati. This is Rex Moreau on Music Business Radio. Music Business Radio, the song Cincinnati. Well, I like this. There's a voice that speaks to me, and I'm not sure if that song ever developed itself out. It's kind yeah. of seemed like it's one of those that's going to wander and, and hopefully get to a triumphant moment at the end. But yeah, he was just teasing us. He's really 
Building yeah, he's building something. But you know what? I love this mixture of sounds. He's got a steel guitar going, and he's got a cello going, and he's got the U2 vibe guitar, and he's got a great voice. So, yeah, I'd, I'd listen to more of that. Well, it's uh, rexmoreau.com if you want to check All out right. more of him. Okay. I will. Oh, look here. Yeah, I mean, it's oddly freed. <laughs> I mean, look at who's on there. Yeah. My God. Adam Schoenfeld. So you know those just, guys. Well, Adam, yeah, I was just we're working with Adam. On um, Big Kenny stuff. And we got to say, this is just purely Roger, coincidental. Roger coincidental. Moudinho, great producer. It's a small world, isn't it? Great mixer. Yeah. Andrew Mendelson mastered it. Well, there's something to be said about working with great people. Well, but he knew how to direct them and get some good stuff. Well, I don't know that we had any winners for you here today with uh, the types of artists that you like, but let's talk more about that. What are you looking for? And maybe if you feel like it, you can give your address out and people can get in touch with you. Okay. You know, I'm looking for artists that are great singers, that have a great sense of song, whether they write them themselves or know where to go find them. I'm looking for artists that aren't waiting around for somebody to make it for them. And I'm looking for ways to develop artists and take them to the marketplace that doesn't require, you know, the two-year development process at record label and then put a single out and watch it eke its way along the charts for 30 weeks to see if you got something. So... Any examples of that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's an artist, uh, Chelsea Williams, out of California, that John McEwen of the Dirt Band called me up out of the blue nine months ago and said, Paul, this is Chelsea Williams. you got to check this out. I'm telling you. So I checked her out online, and I'm like, yeah, she's good. Can I meet her? And he said, well, here, contact her. So I contacted her through MySpace, which is a big leap for me. And uh, <laughs> I'm getting... But, you know, I said, hey, I would like to meet you. Would you come to Nashville and meet with me? And... She emailed me back and said, well, you know, I'm getting ready to make another album, and I'm looking for a producer. Once I find him, I want to make my album and get it in the marketplace. And is it okay if I come see you in, like, at the end of May? And I'm sitting there going, she doesn't know who I think I am. I mean, I, I, I can't believe I'm reaching out to somebody, and she doesn't want, she wants to wait six months to see me. Yeah. So I was impressed, needless to say. I was also impressed that she has sold 35,000 albums on her own. Yeah, that, that makes those records sound really good, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, and you know, she hadn't made the record yet, but here's the person that has a focus and a point of view, and she's not going to be distracted by comets coming in from the left or right, you know? Yeah, she's staying on course. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in 35,000 records sold, that's the artist's development. She has a proven sound, proven product. Yeah, yeah, and so we have met, and she's even more impressive than I thought, and uh, I'm real excited about working with her. I've been working with a group called The Shoals, which is five guys from Muscle Shoals, Country Act, and our approach with them is, is unlike every other developmental process in Nashville. Let's do what isn't done, which let's take an act, let's develop the music, let's get them looking right, but let's get them sounding right. Let's go out and develop our own club circuit and our own relationships with clubs. And so, we set out to do this about seven months ago. Well, now, you know, they're playing Lincoln, Nebraska. They played uh, Savannah, Tennessee. They played Macon, Georgia. They've been playing Louisville, St. Louis. They just got a call to go down to Texas and play Green Hall, which is awesome, and uh, Moe's Place. And then, you know, we found out really easier than we ever dreamed that you can do that. And then they played for us last week after the six months of playing out in the real world, and they kicked Ass. Well, that's a great way to develop, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So the thing is, is when we take it and show it, now we know we're ready. We can bring a label in. We can go, here are the masters, here are the pictures, and listen to this and knock them out. That sounds like great advice for our listeners. If you want to get really good really quick, just go out and just do it live every night. Play, yeah. The people will tell you what you need to hear, whether you're getting across or yeah, not. Yeah, you, you'll know if you're good or not really quick. Won't yeah, you? yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Any final words for our listeners? The music business lives and thrives, and those of us that are musicians and in the music business, because it's who we are and it's what's in our heart, are never going to go away. You can't make us go away. So we have to discover new ways to live because people don't want to pay for music the way they used to. But that is never going to stop us. So here we go. As we were walking in the studio today, you talked about being revitalized. I think that's a great way to end the show. So to talk about that a bit. Two years ago, I was uh, at a real low in my creative life. I, I just felt like I had nothing left to give, nothing left to say, nothing left. I was just very despondent uh, and felt that 
the business wasn't going in a good direction that I thought, and and I just didn't think I had any juice left. And just about that time, I, I was working at Warner Brothers, and I got an advanced copy of Neil Young's Prairie Wind. And I remember that, I will always remember that day, I was sitting in the studio, and they brought it in, and of course, I'm a huge Neil Young fan, and I put the CD on, and I spent the rest of the day sitting on the couch in the back of the studio with the album just cycling over and over and over again for six hours, I don't know, for the rest of the day, with my Martin in my hand, playing along with Neil Young and listening to those great songs, and it brought me back to life. It literally brought me back to life. And I got to tell Neil that when he came to town to do the taping at the Ryman mm -hmm. of Prairie Wind. And again later with the 9-11 uh, concert, I got to meet with him and tell him that he brought me back to life. And I got to thank him for that. And, and, uh, and he was pleased. That's amazing. Well, that's the power of music, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. So uh, hopefully all of our listeners that are making music will, will remember that because... It's easy to be insulated and, and not remember how many people you're touching. Oh, yeah. Music is a language that we all speak, you know. Well, what more can you say? A great show, Paul. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks to everybody who was listening, and thanks especially to the people who sent in for Dave's Demo Derby. If you have any questions, comments, or want to be considered for Dave's Demo Derby in the future, check us out online at musicbusinessradio.com. And I'll see you next week while I'll interview another industry guest. Thank you for listening to Music Business Radio. Music Business Radio is a production of Lightning 100, Tuned In Broadcasting Incorporated, Nashville, Tennessee. Produced by Gary Crane, Dan Buckley, and David Hooper. Pro Tools post-production by Justin Hamill. Production coordination by Jesse Smith. And Lester held the cue cards. Pro audio support provided today by Digidesign with exclusive in-studio guitars courtesy of Waterstone Musical Instruments. For more information about Music Business Radio, visit musicbusinessradio.com. We are Music Business Radio, broadcasting from WRLT Studios at Marathon Village, Nashville, Tennessee. Music. Business.